for those who don't know, uh, my name is Francis. Uh, just started helping out last week, and I've been um, just really grateful. A lot of you have, uh, some of you have emailed, some of you have tried to call, um, or just uh, asking if we can get together and talk. And man, I, I, I so appreciate that. I mean, we've known each other for a couple hours, and uh, you're wanting to connect, which is an honor. I mean, that's cool. I, I guess you kind of like me, or you got something to yell at me about. But um, I just want to say, man, I wish, I wish I could. I wish I could get together with everyone. I'm trying to navigate through this right now because my time is so limited. Um, just so you know, I came on to Abundant Life as a volunteer. I don't get paid. This is, I've got five other jobs. Okay, this is, uh, this is just something where I have a burden for this church. I don't know, the first time I came here, yeah. I sort of coming in and observing and going, God, I just, I want to see life. I, I'd love to see just really abundant life in this room, which, which, which is what you can do, God. And is there anything, any part that you want me to play in it, small, big? And, and as I'm jumping into it, I realize there's a lot of things to be done. And I'm, I'm trying my best to kind of just give what time I can. Um, but just so you know, my, my ministry is primarily in San Francisco, where I'm planting churches um, in the San Francisco area and discipling pastors. I also have a discipleship home where we help people that are coming out of prison or out of addiction and we disciple them in the word and uh, I'm also I also travel every week and speak um, and I, I'm a writer so I spend a lot of time writing and I gotta you know and then I'm just trying to do some business on the side so I don't have to take money from the ministry so I got a couple restaurants and a marina and a hotel and and trying to navigate all of that and yet feeling like God saying okay Give what you can, do what you can. Somehow, you know, it's, 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 you know, for a period of time, for a season, I don't know how long, um, but I, I, you know, I just, I, I'm trying, and I thank you so much for reaching out to me and wanting to get together, just trying to let you, it's not that I don't care or that I don't, uh, you know, that I, my heart's not into this. I'm just trying to give as much of my life as I can. But, but you know, the, the thing is, is, uh, the goal as I talk to the elders is not that I come here and stick around and, and lead everything, but really the goal is discipleship. The goal is that I spend some time, you know, teaching what I can, um, you know, teaching what I can and, and, and uh, with the elders, um, getting into their lives, sharing some of my experience and what I've seen, you know, in church and in and, and health and, and, and same with the staff and trying to do what I can. But um, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's God or nothing. Um, either God is really going to work during this time with the leadership as we, as we gather together and something new is going to happen. Um, it's, everything's in his hands. It's just something I've learned over the years is you, you can't make anything happen. You, you know, all the best things in your life, you didn't really make happen. They just kind of fell on your lap and then, then you pretend you made it happen. But you, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those things. And so for me, right now, I just go, okay, God, I don't know how long you have me here. I'll be obedient to you. But uh, today, what do you want me to do today? That's just the way I live. It's like, I don't know if I'll even be around tomorrow. And so today, God, what do you want me to say today? If this is my last message on this planet, what do you want me to say? That's, that's the way I think. I, you know, it's, it's life is short. It just, it just goes. So, so what is it, God? What do you want me to say today? And today, the one thing I just want to be so sure of, I mean, absolutely sure of, and I want you to be sure of, is that you genuinely have a relationship with God. And, and, and that if this was the last day of your life, that you just have absolute confidence going, man, that would be great. That would be great if this was the last day of my life. I'm so, so secure in this, my relationship with that almighty God that we talked about last week. That God is for me. That is the most important relationship to me. And so if, if this were the last day of my life, I welcome that because for me to live is him. 
And, and, and if I can have more of him and be even closer to him before this day is over and I'm actually in his presence, man, that would be the greatest experience of my life to have that type of confidence because I know that people show up to church and some of you get here and there's this uneasy feeling of, yeah, I, I think I believe, I'm pretty sure I believe, I'm pretty sure if this was the last day of my life, I'd come into his presence, but that, that bit of doubt, I just want it gone. You know, because I think there are people here who, you know, will sing songs and talk about the return of Christ and go, man, I'd love for him to come back. But really, you know, I think there are people here who secretly wish that Jesus would not return today. Seriously. Right? Because you're thinking, you know what? I, I know the truth about me. Maybe no one else in the room here knows, but I'm not sure that this is for real. And as I, as I prayed about this, man, I was up at 3 a.m. this morning praying for you, thinking about you. I couldn't sleep. There, there was a sense of, honestly, a little bit of heaviness entering into the day and going, God, this is serious stuff. I mean, we're talking about where you go forever. And, and the heaviness was, I, I think, maybe some of you are here just out of coincidence, just out of tradition, you grew up in a Christian home, so you went to a Christian church, and you've been doing this routine, but you yourself, do you know him? Like personally, where it has nothing to do with your family. If all your family denied Jesus, you're the type that says, no, 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 I know him, and I will follow him, regardless of what anyone else says or does. I started saying, gosh, I, I hope there are people, maybe there's some of you today, that you, you know what I'm talking about. You've just been showing up. You've been showing up to church for years. But there's something missing in here. You're going, man, I read this book and I don't see that in my life. That type of power. I, 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 I was burdened last night because I thought, gosh, I wonder how many of you have been just exposed and taken in false teaching. Where someone just told you, hey, this is the way to heaven. Or that you're a good person. Or just pray this prayer. And you never really studied the word of God for yourself to see what Jesus himself says. That concerns me. And then there's others where I, I, I just, you know, all these burdens last night, just, just going, God, there, there's probably some here who even made a decision some, at some point. And you're resting upon this emotional decision. You go, man, I remember that day I raised my hand, I cried, you know, I decided to follow Jesus. But there's been no change in your life. You haven't really experienced this death to life experience. Man, and just because you make a decision, that doesn't make you a Christian. We all make decisions. January 1st of this year, I ran four miles. I hadn't run in years, but I was challenged by a bunch of people like, let's, let's just all run together, we'll run four miles, okay? I did it, I did it. It wasn't pretty, but I made it. And I decided on January 1, 2014, I go, I am going to run every day this year. Even if it's half a mile, I'm going to run, get back in shape. I've run maybe a total of four miles since January 1. <laughs> I made a decision, okay? We all make decisions. That's why every year the gyms, they love January 1st. Right? Because lots of people make decisions to work out. But then what happens? Around April, May, June, some of you guys are still paying your membership and you have not gone in months. You made a decision, but was that decision real? Was my decision to run real? Man, people make decisions. People come to an altar and even make vows for better or for worse. I promise for better or for worse. They made the decision. They made the vow even. But they didn't mean for worse. There were limitations. I'm just saying we make decisions and people make decisions to follow Jesus doesn't mean we do it. I, was, I, I, I thought I was sincere January 1st. I guess I wasn't. And some are saying, I thought I was sincere when I was on that altar. I guess I wasn't. And in the same way, some of us can look at our lives and say, gosh, I remember deciding to follow Jesus, and then I didn't. 
the change never took place in my life, which means it probably wasn't for real. And I just, I, I, I'm not doing that out of guilt. Man, trust me, I'm not coming as a judge. I, I'm coming as a doctor saying I see some symptoms. I'm not judging you. I'm just seeing some symptoms of, of, of this. You might have this. You might have this. You know, can, can we help you? How, can, can we cure that? Can we heal? That's what Jesus came. He came as this great physician. He will return as a judge. But right now, it's just like, no, look at your life. Are there some symptoms of you may have just talked? You know, like First John says, you know, those who say they know him but don't obey his command are liars. It, it just says there's people who say they know him, made a decision to know him, but they continue in their lifestyle. And, and John says, gosh, those people are liars. And uh, that, that's why it was hard for me. Uh, to sleep last night, just thinking, gosh, I don't know you. <laughs> if I look at your faces and I just try to imagine, what if I was sitting out there? What would I want someone to say to me? What is going to matter a hundred years from now? Did I shoot straight with you? Did I lay it out and say, look, as a doctor, as someone who's been studying this book a lot, I go, I get concerned about people in America who attend these gatherings called churches and whether or not they really, really know Jesus and have experienced the life that the Holy Spirit has for them. So I, uh, I want to go into scripture. I, I know that some of you are saying, well, I don't even know if I believe in the Bible. And you know what? That's, that's for another time. We can talk about that. I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. And we'll read from the Bible. So, you know, I'm not making it up. You can follow along in the scriptures because we have to go to the scriptures. We're all taught so many different things throughout the, the days. And, if, and, and the Bible says that there's a wide road that leads to destruction. And many will enter through it. It's a wide, easy road. And then there's this narrow road that leads to life and few will find it. And, 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 and so most of the teaching we're going to get and hear throughout the day is this wide road teaching. And we've got to look at the scriptures and say, what does it say? Now, last week we talked about God. That's where we start. Why? Because in the beginning, God, okay? It, it, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, okay? We have to have that as the foundation, what we talked about last night, that look, this is not about us here on this earth. It's not about anyone in this room. There's a being. It's not like, well, this guy's higher than this guy. This guy's more important than this guy. No, there are two types of beings. There's human beings and there's God. And there's a gap. That's all there is. There's holy, holy, holy God where the angels are bowing down. So we understand, okay, I'm not here to tell God what he's done wrong and judge his commands. No, I stand before him. I bow before him. He is God. And, and I, my, one of my concerns is we throw that word around God so flippantly and we underestimate, we grossly underestimate what it's going to feel like when we actually enter into his presence. When this life is over and we stand before that God, man, I cannot exaggerate what a shock that moment's going to be. We saw it with Isaiah last week, right? Here's this prophet of God and he just goes, I'm dead. I cannot believe I just came into the presence of God. It's, it's going to be an absolute shock for all of us. In the beginning, God created. You, every single one of you in this room, you were created by God. I don't care what you were told your whole life, you were created by God. You were made by him. And what the Bible teaches is, man, somehow you know this. It doesn't matter all the lies you've been told that you created yourself or that you were an accident. No, the Bible says that you were made by him and, and there's a sense in which you have no excuse. No matter what's been, been when, you know, taught in class, what's been told to you by your parents, what Romans 1 verse 20 says, it says, for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. 
It says ever since God made this world, it says you could see his invisible qualities and his divine nature through what, he, what was made. His everyone, so that so no one has an excuse in here. That somehow you can look around and know that you were made by God. You were created by him. You were not an accident. In fact, he says it's not even an accident that you're in this room. He determined when you were born, where you would be born, where you would live. This is all in Acts chapter 17. You were created by him. Man, I, I remember even as a kid, when I learned about the earth, I was like, this is, this is insane. You're, you're tell, I mean, think about it. I mean, you and I right now, we're sitting on a ball. Okay, straight below us is this core of magma, lava, fire, surrounded by water, covered in two-thirds water, this round ball, and we're spinning right now at a thousand miles an hour. And you're just sitting there. Well, yeah, of course, that always happens. Yeah, and you know this thing that's spinning a thousand miles an hour, and we're flying around the sun. Does that ever just make you think, like I am flying around a ball of fire that is 1.3 million times the size of the earth, and I'm flying around it at 67,000 miles an hour right now. It's 93 million miles away as I'm spinning and circling around it, and we go, mm, it's a little hot today. Are you kidding me? 93 million miles away, if we were a little bit closer to the sun, we would burn. The tiniest further away, we would freeze, and we're spinning, we're tilted just right, everything going 67,000 miles an hour. We're sitting in this room, we're talking, we're thinking, we're feeling, we're laughing, we're crying, and we go, it's all an accident? Really? Explain the love you feel. How did that just evolve? Explain your tears. Explain your anger. Explain your laughter. Just think about these things, it's brilliant. God says you can look at the way the world was created and you see his divine nature, his invisible attributes through everything that was made. He goes, you know that there was a creator and you know that there's not an accident, that something tells you no, I can look around and I see God. I just see him. And so that it's, it's an awesome feeling to know that I'm not a mistake. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. Your parents might tell you you were an accident. We didn't plan you, but you, you're not. God says, no, no, no. I made you. I have a reason for you being on that earth right now. And we were not created according to scripture. Colossians 1.16, it says that all things were created by him and for him. Don't miss that word. For him. Why was I created? I was created for him. I'm not here to say, oh, look what Francis does. Look at No, I'm saying, no, look at this being who's keeping this world in motion as we're spinning around and created us so uniquely to where we know that he's there. Man, worship him, worship him, worship him. I was created for him to point to the cross. That's why, again, we want the body and blood of Jesus Christ up here. This is what we are here for. This is what we are all here. This is what we exist for, not just Sunday mornings for an hour, but our whole lives we were created by him and for him. And he says, whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do it all for the glory of God. You know, I, I think about, I, I try to take scripture literally, and I even just think, okay, how do you eat, drink for the glory of God? You know, like everything should point to him. How, how, do, I, how do I eat? Um, I brought a cookie. Um, <laughs> But the thought of eating, I mean, when God created things, you know, if you read in Genesis 1, every time he made something, it says, he says, that was good. You know, he created light, darkness, he goes, that's good. My whole job is just to agree with God and say, yes, Lord, this earth is amazing. The, the sun, the way everything works, that's incredible. 
the way that I feel about my kids and love them and care for them and love and cherish my, like all this, this, emo, this, is, this is wonderful. Then every once in a while you even break through and do supernatural things on the earth where I get to experience that in the way you answer my prayer. This is, this is incredible. But even in the little things of how we eat, do you ever think about how God created that and go, wow, that was good. I mean, isn't eating awesome? Oh, this is eating to the glory of God right here. You know how when you chew, like right now, there's chocolate, there's nuts, there's caramel. You just go, wow, this is really good. God could, I mean, just the way it hits your tongue, you know? How when you bite, even the biting is kind of fun, right? The texture, and then hits your tongue, and all this saliva comes from everywhere. And your brain's going, man, this tastes good. And you're chewing, and the whole thing's just mushing up. And it hits the back of your throat. Mmm. Still got a little in your mouth. Going down your stomach. I'm going, wow, that's, that was really good. God, that was amazing. God, God created that. The taste, everything, the way that it works, the way it, it gives us nutrients. Well, this doesn't give you any nutrients, but you know, <laughs> normally, I mean... God made that. He could have just made us like the plants, right? Where we just walk and we suck things up by our feet, you know, through the dirt. But no. He goes, watch what I make. I'm going to make eating. And you go, wow, that was good, God. God, what an amazing creation. Everything to find him in it. I mean, that's God's creation. I mean, God could have made us like the plants. He, you know, we, we've, got, we've got seven kids. It's our seventh kid's on the way. God could have made it to where we would hold hands and she'd be pregnant. But no. You know, you go, wow, are you kidding me right now? This is unreal. This is our creator God, the brilliance of everything. While we're spinning around the earth, while we're flying around, everything that he made, we go, wow, Lord, you are a great and glorious God. You made us for you, you, all of your creation, everything you made, every emotion I have points to you. You're an amazing being. And some of you have been told something else the rest of your life, your whole life, that you're just an accident. I understand there's pain and we can talk about that. We've experienced pain, we've all experienced pain, but that does not negate what God created. All of us have been victims of other people and because he gave man free will, people are going to hurt us. And we're going to hurt others. And so what, what, what else can we do? Because of the sin on the earth and that curse that we read about in Adam and Eve, there's death on this earth. There's some of you that are sick right now. Some of you that are grieving people who are sick right now. Now I remember as a 12-year-old just grieving as my dad was, was wasting away of cancer. And just going, God, I don't get it. I don't get it. But later on you read the scriptures and you understand it's for, because of our sin. And there's an enemy here. And there's a bigger picture. But what, whether it's good or bad, we're supposed to use everything for his glory. Even the pain. For those of us who are in pain right now and suffering, we're to show people, look, I can still rejoice in the Lord because there's something bigger. I know him. You know? And I know this is, uh, the things on earth are temporary right now. These light and momentary afflictions, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, are achieving for me this eternal weight of glory that far outweighs all the pain I'm going through. You glorify God. You go, okay, he's go having me go through difficult times. Watch what I do. I'm going to praise him through it. Others of you, you're in a season of blessing where God's given you so much. And you honor God through that, saying, God, I don't even care about all this stuff. I'll give it to the poor. I'll give it to the lost. I, I, I'm, I'm going to invest it for your kingdom because money doesn't make me happy. You do. Uh, you know, even my health. If I'm healthy, I'm going to use it for the Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll use every moment I can for him. Everything's for him. The pain, the health, the wealth, everything is to be used by his glory. God has different ones of us in different seasons of our lives because he wants to show that, look, I'm great no matter what in these people's eyes. Those who are blessed, they don't get into all of their blessings and go, oh man, look at this, I, I love all these gifts. No, I love the giver of the gifts. And the gifts, I, I could give or take, I don't need all this stuff like the world does to make them happy. 
You know, and that's what that early church was like. They're like, man, my stuff is, I, I don't care. I care about you guys. I care about people. If you're in need, I'll sell my stuff and give it to you because I, I love this God. My stuff doesn't matter. We show by our lives. We show through our pain. We live for the glory of God. And I want you to understand that some of us have not lived for his glory. We live for our own pleasure. We don't, we, we don't look at ourselves as these created beings created for him. We, we almost feel like he created us and then we're just free to do whatever we want and just please ourselves. And many of us have lived for our own pleasure. That's what Adam and Eve did. They got to a point where they didn't want to stay under the authority of God. And God says, no, don't eat of that tree. And they're just like, well, did God really say that? Man, you know, I think this is going to be good for me. I think this is going to work out for me. And they just kind of came out from under his lordship, out of his kingdom. And you know the rest of the story. And yet we live in a time, look, I, I get this. I know that many of you come here and you feel like you're a good person. Man, I get that because you look at some of the good things you do and you go, I think I'm inherently good because I have a desire for good. And that's great. I think we all have some desire for good. But do we carry it out? And sometimes we, we compare ourselves to those who we go, no, no, they're evil. Those, those people that are beheading people right now in Iraq, they're evil. Not me. I'm a good person. God will see that. And all your friends tell you, no, you're a good person. And you, you get this all your life. Your parents say, no, you're a good person. You're a good kid. You're good this. You're good that. You guys, I'm, I don't want to argue with your friends or whatever. I just want to tell you what the word of God says. And what the word of God in, in Romans is what the Bible says. I'm not saying you have to agree with it. I'm just telling you what scripture says. In Romans 3, verse 23, it says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That all of us, everyone in this room is a sinner. That, that, that we, we haven't come under his lordship perfectly. We fall short of his standard. That's why Isaiah last week took one glimpse of God and goes, I'm dead. I, I'm a man of unclean lips. I know my sin. I know what I've done. You know what you've done in this room. We need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. You may not think it, you may not feel it, but you do need it. You may have friends telling you over and over how good you are, but I promise you that your friends are not going to be there at the end of your life as a jury judging you and saying, yeah, you're good, like we told you while you're on earth. There's no jury there. It's God, the judge. You stand before him, your creator, and he's going to reveal to you, no, you weren't good. You want to go through your life? You want to see it all? And so if we come with this arrogance before God of, I deserve, let me in because I'm a good person, I promise you, you're not going to get in. The Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and God as a perfect father, he has a punishment for that. I don't like to talk about this part, okay? I mean, it, it, I hate talking about this, to be honest. But the Bible does say that he created a place for Satan and his demons to punish them. But in Revelation 20, he explains that anyone whose name was not written in the book of life, he was placed there also. Okay, look, I know some of you want to tune me out right now saying, no, I don't believe in hell. I go, just let me read a couple verses from Scripture. Re do you believe this part? Revelation 20, verse 10. It says, The devil who had deceived them and was thrown into the lake of fire. Wait, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Man, that is hard to stomach. It's hard to read. I mean, but some of us, we rejoice because we go, well, that's a beast and the false prophet. That's the devil. But understand, they are the create who created them. 
See, people are always saying, well, if he's a loving God, how could a loving God punish his creation? For some reason, we separate the devil, we separate the false prophet, we separate the, the beast and go, you know what, well, well, that's different. No, they were his created being, and, and what's he saying? Then at the end, they're going to be thrown in this lake of, of fire and sulfur to be tormented day and night forever and ever. And, and then in verse 15, it says, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Look, I, I'd erase this if I could, but I'm saying this is God's word. He's just saying this. He goes, man, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown in this lake of fire. You, you think I, I wake up and go, I want to believe in hell. I want to believe in this lake of fire. No, I'm just saying I have chosen to surrender myself to this book and go, whatever it says, best I can understand. And I go, gosh, that sounds like what he's saying. And, and so many people write me off at this moment and go, that doesn't make sense. I go, that makes total sense. It makes sense. I, I'm not saying I like it, but I get it. If I created this world, if I'm a creator and I make punish, this may be more severe than I would have chosen, but I don't get it. And I just go, God, you know what? You have every right. Who am I? What am I going to go up to him? The God that we talked about last week and say, you have no right. I just go, God, okay, I get it. We're guilty. We should be punished. That makes sense. Let me tell you what doesn't make sense. I've been a Christian for like 35 years, and I'm still going, this still doesn't totally make sense to me. You know what doesn't make sense is Romans 5.8. In Romans 5.8, this doesn't make sense, what the Creator did. If he's all powerful, if he's almighty, then this is what we need to question. As Romans 5 8, it says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, if something doesn't make sense, that would be it. It makes sense. He made you. You screwed up. He should punish you. What doesn't only totally make sense is that almighty, holy, holy, holy God is looking at you and going, man, but I don't want to punish you. I should punish you. You deserve punishment, but I don't want to punish you. You know what? It says that he demonstrates his love for us, that that God loved us, loved me, even then while I was a sinner, while I'm rebelling, do my own thing, this is what feels good to me, God says, I still love you, and I love you so much, I want to demonstrate my love to you and everyone else in that world. Watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to have my own son who knew no sin. I'm going to have him come down on the earth, take the form of a man, and I'm going to have him die on the cross for you. I'm, I'm going to show this earth the greatest act of love ever. Me, almighty God, with all of these angels, I'm going to have my son take the form of a little baby, an infant. And I'm going to just have him spit on. I'm going to have him beat on. I'm going to have him nailed to a cross. He says, why? Because, in, again, Romans 3, it says that, that, that our, all of sin falls short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in, in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God says, look, I'm a righteous God. I have to punish you can't just commit a crime and no one pay for it. So I don't want to punish you, but I've got to punish someone. Otherwise, I'm not righteous. A right judge must punish when a crime is committed. And yet he looks at us. You guys, this is the crazy part of our faith. It's not heaven and hell. The crazy part is the cross. The crazy part is the body and blood of Jesus. Like, wait, really? You're going to take him and you're going to take his body and he's going to come down and he's going to be broken? 
Really? You're going to have his blood shed for us? Why? We're the ones that messed up. And the Bible says because he so loved the world. Man, do you get that? Someone paid for your sin so that God could be fair and still justify you for everything you've done and deem you righteous. He made Jesus take on our sin in that cross. Do you understand how deep the Father's love is? Zeke, can you come up here? This is my son, Zeke. Hey, buddy. <laughs> I just, I just remember the first time it, it hit me, and I just, you know, I heard the message my whole life, ever since I was a kid, and then I started having kids, and I thought, what would I feel if you guys took him right now and started spitting on him? What, what would I do if you guys uh, grabbed my son and started whipping him? blindfolding him, mocking him. What would I do if some of you guys took him up on that cross right now and started driving stakes through his hands and feet while everyone else is screaming, kill him, crucify him. What would I do as a dad? I, I started thinking, that. I go, God, I can't do that. I couldn't watch that. And you're telling me you went through that for me, but I'm, I'm so screwed up. I've done, you know what I've done. You and I know the things that I've done, and you're, you're watching your son suffer like that for me? And, then, and at a point in your life, you just got to go, wait, God Almighty went through that for me. Here's my life. What do I need to do? Where do I sign up? He's saying that it's by this grace and it's just by believing in that that I'm saved. Come on, God, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? Anything, anything. You're the creator, almighty God. I'm a sinner. I should be burning in hell right now. And you love me so much that you watched your son die on a cross for me. Then he rose from the grave, ascended into heaven. He's going to come back and judge one day. What do I need to do? See, that's the exact question that they asked in Acts chapter two when Peter preached. It says in Acts two verse 37, the people heard the message of Jesus and the words out of their mouth, it says in Acts two verse 37, it says they were cut to the heart and said, what do we need to do? They said, okay, are you kidding me right now? So I'm gonna stand before that God and I can be completely righteous, I can be totally right? He says, where do I sign up? What do I need to do? And do you know what Peter's answer was in Acts 2, verse 38, the very next verse? He did not say, pray a prayer. He says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. See, people were doing amazing things back then. They're like, what is this all about? He says, you know what? If you would repent and get baptized, you too would be filled with this Holy Spirit. He says, this promise is for you, for your children, and for those who are 2,000 years later. Those who are far off. He says, this is the promise. Look, you repent. You be baptized and filled with the Spirit. And it is crazy to me that in America, when we say, how do I become a Christian? We don't talk about repentance. We don't talk about baptism. We don't talk about the Holy Spirit. How did we miss that? They go, what do you do? Repent. That's what Jesus, that's the first thing he says. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the first thing John the Baptist said. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now Peter, first sermon, repent. Repent does not mean, okay, I'll, I'll add Jesus to my life. It means a turning. The word repent means you change, you turn. You are walking, living your own way, living for your own pleasure. You hear about what God did on the cross for you and you go, forget me. I'm done with me. I'm done the way I was living. I turn, I go towards you now. I want you, I'm following you. That's what repentance means. Man, I don't know what gospel you were taught, but the gospel I read about in this book is about us turning from ourselves. It's not just we go on in life and say, hey God, come on in. Follow me, God. 
Like someone described, you know, it's, it's like, I, I, was, I understood this as a young age. That you're not just driving along in life and you see Jesus and say, wow, there's Jesus. And you pop the trunk. Get in. Get in, Jesus. I could really use you if I go through painful times. I could use you if I get sick. I could use you if I need more money. Get in. I need you. He's not getting in the trunk. You can open the back seat. He's not getting in. You can open the passenger seat door and say, Jesus, come on in. We'll just be buddies. Let me just take you where I want to go. He's not coming in until you get out of the car, hand him the keys and say, you drive. That's what repentance is. Repentance is a man, I've been going my own direction and I see who Jesus, wait, the son of God who died for my sins. If he's for me, who can be against me? Here, here's the keys, here's everything. I wanna follow you. Here, you drive, you take me. That's repentance. I wanna go a new direction, surrender to him. That's what baptism was. It was to be baptized into his death. Jesus says in Matthew 10, he says, unless you deny me, pick up, and deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, you can't be my follower, you can't be my disciple. It's, it's you denying yourself. You're saying, you know what? I've been crucified with Christ. Forget Francis, forget what Francis wants anymore. I just want whatever he wants. If that's what he did for me, that's what it means to be, be baptized, is saying I am dying to my old self and I'm gonna rise again and live for Jesus. It's death. I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I'm not driving anymore. I just give him control. He says, you do that. You repent. You be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That's how you're forgiven. It's, 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 it's associating yourself with the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says, and you'll receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. Look, you understand what he's saying there? He's saying, I'll put my spirit in you. And now you'll have the ability to walk away from your sin and live the way that, you, that, that, that I want you to. It's something spiritual that happens. See, this was bugging me last night too. Was I was just going, God, I can't make anyone in this room fall in love with Jesus. But I just pray, I go, God, could something of your spirit happen this morning where someone comes in and I'm not manipulating this, but that you hear this message and you're going, I get it, I get it, I want that. I want the Holy Spirit in me. I, I, I don't wanna live for me anymore. I get this majesty of God and what he did on the cross. I wanna turn and follow Jesus. I wanna get baptized right now. I prayed for that. You see, it says in, in Acts chapter two, you know, when, when, after he gave that message and they said, what do we need to do? You know, and, and he says, repent, be baptized and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for, for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. So Peter just kept going, come on you guys. Look, save yourself from this crooked generation. Look, you're living on an earth that's telling you live for the here and now and I'm telling you run from that. You guys live in the Silicon Valley, the epitome of it of riches about me, 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 what kind of kingdom can I build for myself? And I'm telling you that kingdom's not gonna last. Don't believe the lies. There's an eternal kingdom. We, we have a much greater treasure. And I'm saying turn, save yourself from this crooked generation. Today, I'm not gonna beg you. If you hear his voice, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. I'm not gonna ask you to pray a prayer. I'm gonna ask you to do what I see in the words of scripture. Repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the Holy Spirit of God. Are you ready to turn? I even prayed, I said, you know what? Get the baptismal ready today because there may be some of you today who are saying, you know what? 
just like they did back then. They just went right down to the water and said, what do I need to do? I want this right now. Nothing's going to stop me. He says, okay, let's go. Turn from your lifestyle. Let's get baptized and ask God's spirit to fall upon you and help you to become who he wants you to be. And if that's you today and you go, man, I want that and you're ready to get baptized, we want to baptize you right now. And some of you, <laughs> you know, we are trying to do everything as biblically as possible and going, that's what they did, that's what we want to do. And some of you guys are going, but I wasn't ready, I, I, I'm, I'll get my car wet. And I would just say to you, if you're worried about going home wet, then you didn't understand the message I gave you. Okay? just so you have brothers and sisters in other parts of the world where they know the moment they get baptized they could die right then people are watching and they're saying look nothing's going to stop me i know what god did for me and i will publicly confess in front of everyone that i'm ready to die to myself just like jesus died on that cross and i'm going to rise again to a new life